which I'm really greatly looking forward to listening to. So if you could join me in welcoming him, please. How's everybody doing? Great. I hope everybody can hear my accent. Uh, I wasn't born here, and the accent is something that I have very little to do with. <laughs> that's how. <laughs> that's what I first got acclimated to. So please bear with me. All right, my name is Chef Kubui. I'm uh, here from uh, visiting from North Carolina. I'm actually very happy to be visiting this place for the first time in my uh, uh, in my visit to the U.S. Um, I started my journey in Kenya. I spent 20 years of my life there. And that's where I learned most of the things that I, I do now. My father owned a restaurant, uh, and my grandfather, and my father had been, my family had been involved in food for over 300 documented years. But uh, for 130 uh, documented years, my family has been involved in food activism. So my grandfather uh, opposed selling food to the British when they first came. Uh, and you know, people thought that was a bad idea. He was being backwards. Then two years later, uh, there was famine in my country, uh, so 40% of the population died because they had sold all the food they had. So since then, my father uh, also had a restaurant, and that's why uh, I learned how to cook. Most of my cooking method, all inspiration to cook, came from my having worked with my father and my family with the food. Uh, so I came to this country to go to school. I studied political science, undergraduate in philosophy. And then I went on to do a master's in medical anthropology and urban anthropology because I noticed that uh, most of the population is moving to the urban areas. And then there's a connection between food and politics. And second, thirdly, there's a connection between food and health. So then after that, I went to culinary school. So I felt like now I've learned every bit. So I do gardening. I'm an urban gardener. So I grow most of the food. I have a group called uh, Finnish uh, Culinary School. I opened, I started a group called Organics and Sounds. And Organics and Sounds is a, a community-based group that combines food, community, and art. So, and we prepare the highest food, we are activists, food activists, that prepare the highest level food uh, that we know. If you know any way better we can improve, please, we're always looking to grow. And we go all around the country, uh, so we don't have a restaurant, so we cook, or we prepare the food where the people are and all our dinners, so we host dinners, four, five, six, seven course organic dinners that are essentially fresh, uh, non-frozen, non-canned food. Uh, and we say in our cooking, you don't have to practice defensive eating. So we prepare all food that's good for you. Now, today I'm going to speak very briefly, but before I speak, in my culture, there is a term, there is actually a saying or a proverb that says, you do not speak to an empty stomach. You're crazy if you can think you can speak speak to an empty stomach and think you're going to communicate with them. So before further ado, I'm going to ask my sous chefs, uh, Miranda, uh, to start passing us some food. So because we didn't have a cooking demonstration here, we thought about doing a cooking demonstration. So we figured as a treat, we prepare some food and then uh, I'll talk to you as you sample the food. And uh, what we prepare for you is a millet. First of all, I tell you, in all my dinners, I always introduce my food, and I don't cook buffet. All my food are plated. So I ask uh, my uh, sous chefs if they can be kind enough to do the same thing, plate it for you, and they've been very cooperative. So uh, the reason why, I tell you why we plate the food. We plate the food and we use the system of cooking because of two things. You first eat with your nose, right? You smell the spices in the kitchen, so wow, it smells good, right? Then, secondly, uh, you, uh, secondly, you eat with your eyes. Then you see it, you say, wow, it's really good. Then you eat with your mouth, okay? So that's why we plate the food, and all my food is plated. And then, the person who prepares the food prepared it with a certain perspective, really. So I prepare it, I, I know exactly what I, I prepare the food. And food is the most intimate thing you ever touch with your life more intimate than anybody else. If your wife, your child, there's nothing more intimate than your food. If you don't eat, you die, right? You can be married and what? Divorced, right? So you can have a child and not have a child anymore, right? And you can have some more children. And you can adopt some children, all right? Or you can give your children away if you have them. But food, you cannot do any of those things. You have food, you have to eat food. You ate food when you were young, you eat till you die. That's one thing, and that's something we don't buy used. 
I don't know anybody who used bison, use food, you know, there's no place I've never seen used food over here being sold, okay? So, for that reason, I consider food to be very intimate. So a lot of people have been referred in many uh, terms, but one of the terms that I've been referred to that I want to uh, uh, mention here is a radical share. So I have a radical approach to food. I approach food first politically, because I know food is the most political thing you also have to ever touch with your life. There's nothing more political than food, okay? So for those people who are trying to work and advocate on behalf of good food, they're actually doing the most political thing they can do. For Jaffa, you can look, we can go back to Jaffa, so even back. Some of those people who are who the founding fathers of this country were very, very good farmers. They had very, very intimate relationship with food. In fact, Jefferson said that he is doing what he did, he did what he did so that he, hoping that his son would be a marine engineer and then his grandson would be a farmer because farming is the most delectable of all professions that anybody can have. So, back to my growing up as you enjoy the food. Now, first of all, I'll tell you the food, about the food. So, the food you're enjoying is gluten-free, is all fresh, is organic, all organic, and has nothing processed, doesn't have any cornstarch, any highly processed oil, and it's also gluten-free, doesn't have nuts, okay? Uh, and uh, nothing came out of a pocket. So, you know, it's bulk, you know, we didn't get anything from a box. So we are also trying to minimize our carbon footprint by packages, okay? So you have millet as a starch. We boil the millet, and there's a reason why I prepared millet. Millet is one of the longest domesticated grains that we use. I don't know anybody who has any uh, uh, allergic reaction to millet. So millet is a very, very good grain to use. Wow. Now, millet is also good for several other things. The millet is very easy to digest, it's highly nutritious, it's very easy to cook. It takes about 20 minutes. It took about 20 minutes for us to boil it. And uh, it has uh, a lot of fiber. So it goes, cleans your stomach, all right? So once we boil the millet, we saute it on a different part. We let it cool down. After it cools down, we break it up loose. On a separate part, we take garlic, Vardalia onions, cilantro, and uh, some, uh, I think we use some cumin, all right, and chili, all right? So we cook that uh, in olive oil, and then we add beets, with fresh organic beets, purple beets. We square them, we cube them, we put them in there with some cubed celery. All right, and then we put some tomatoes and it becomes a little saucy. And red bell peppers. All right, we cook that for a minute, then put the millet. It's already cool millet, millet. And we turn around and that's what you're having. And then we have sauteed vegetable, we have an apple cabbage, we have kale, we have a celery, and uh, a few carrots, and uh, just the same spices, all right? So that's what you are enjoying. So please enjoy. I never cook food without sauce. But again, because of the limitations that we have, again, this time you're going to be Madisonians and you're going to be polite and uh, you forgive me for it. Can you do that? Are we all right so far? All right, now let's talk about uh, enjoy the food and let's talk about uh, veganism. Now, having grown up in Africa, uh, my mother was a coffee, uh, what, uh, a coffee farmer, so she you have a small coffee farm. And uh, my mother claimed that she was losing money on the coffee plantation. Uh, I was born about six, uh, six years after the country became independent. So the country was going through a lot of redefin redefining itself, or actually reconstituting itself after colonialism. So I asked my mother, why are we growing coffee if you're losing money on it? Oh, she told me, oh, well, uh, you know, this is the only thing we have to do, but anyway. Whatever she told me, I wasn't satisfied. I said, let's approve the coffee. She said, no, that's illegal. So at a very young age, I started being very interested in understanding how the global food system was set up, okay? Now, that's my background. So, and that has driven my educational career. So after I graduated, I wanted to study political science so that I can understand the politics that has set up this global system that's so unfair. So, now, having grown up in Kenya, 
or, or, combine, or combining the experience of growing up, having grown up in Kenya, and my experience of having spent some time here in America, uh, has given me a very unique perspective about the food movement. Wow. So when I hear veganism, veganism tells me at least two basic things. People who have a very high and elevated form of consciousness. Two, people who are gaining a very high level of political consciousness. If you don't have your politics set, you cannot talk about veganism. Veganism is a, almost a status symbol. You have a lot of food, so you choose. You can choose to eat soy, you can choose to use eat uh, satan, uh, fish, you can do all, all kinds of stuff, right? But when you are politically dominated, and this country has always, always had people who are politically dominated or politically powerless people, group of people, and it can become from the Native Americans, then it can be the Greeks, then it can be uh, the, the Germans who come, the, uh, the people who are from uh, Africa, people who are Hispanic, then it depends on what time. But there's always somebody who's at the bottom of the map, uh, of the political map. Then when you have no power politically, then you have no choices. You have very little choices that you can make. So you basically eat what has been chosen for you to eat. And choices doesn't have to be necessarily be told you have to eat this. But social conditions can be such that economically you can only afford to eat certain things. Okay? So I found it amazing in understanding the food movement and understanding now how me, I as a Kenyan, or Kenya fitted in this global food system, that uh, when I came to this country and heard about organic food, that food, organic food was actually a reactionary term. That somebody has created something other than food, which is food stuff, right? For commercial purposes, just to make profit. And then has forced now food to label itself as organic food. That's one. So that's a sign of power imbalance. All right? In all this discussion, let me set the foundation that I will be wasting my time and your time if I don't talk about the power relationship in the context of food. Right now, let me explain what I mean by the power dynamics of power relationship. In my understanding, all power is illegitimate unless it fulfills three basic conditions. One, the power has to prove itself to be legitimate. So if I have power over you, I have to prove the burden of proof is on me to prove that my power over you is legitimate. One thing. Second thing, it has to give a very clear definition of how illegitimate power would look like. So if I'm giving you power over me, I need to know when the, you know, the power becomes legitimate, how would it look like? Number three, in case the power becomes legitimate, what recourse do I have? Now if you listen to those basic definitions of power and power relationship, or the division of legitimate power versus illegitimate power, that's what the constitution of the United States is based on. You know, it says all men are created what? Equal. And endowed by the created by what? Certain what? And alienable rights. Right? And it goes on that whenever this government becomes despotic, it's upon the people, right? To rise up and uh, overthrow this despotic uh, and illegitimate power over them. So if you think about it and look at our food system, so much power has been em uh, imparted on the corporations in this country that is a shame for us to claim that we are a free country. It's a travesty to our democracy, or to the term democracy, or to, for us to call ourselves a democratic country, when so much of the food power is in the hands of very few corporations. Now, when I talk about business in Kenya, it's almost a, a non-existent term. Because a lot of people in Kenya are vegans, not by choice, because they can't afford meat. 
We dump all this corn that we produce here, controlled by Conagra, which is the largest privately held corporation in the US, owned by just by privately held. They are the brokers of corn. As one governor said, and almost got fired, I can't remember his name now. And he said, there's a lot of money in farming, except when you're a farmer. And you can basically tell the political situation of a people just by looking at the food. I go throughout the country, I go all over the world, and I look at how, what kind of relationship, even without talking to people, and I look at the kind of relationship people have with their food, and I can almost to the point, to the letter, tell what kind of political power they have, or how, what the kind of politics they have in their country. So if a lot of our food decisions are being made by corporations, then you know a lot of people are powerless. The Americans are powerless. So we are having to argue and spend so much time because simply because of one thing, somebody has used up our power and the food we eat is not free food. It's not what I call civic food. So as I travel through the world, I'm looking for the civility in food. And civic food, food means that the people who consume or are involved in the production and the consumption of the food have control over the food at every stage of the food in the food system, in the food chain. But when you have GMO, somebody say, hey man, I own the patent on this. Then you have no power. Okay? So we start having really bad food. Because the food decisions are being made, they are not being made for creating better food system, it's being made of healthy food, it's being made simply for profit. So if you can make take corn and corn becomes so cheap and you're making and you're raising grass-fed beef, you cannot compete me if I'm feeding my cows. Corn. And corn, Conagra is the biggest broker in corn. And that's exactly what they use. They get it for they bribe the government. You know, I hear all about corruption. People talk about this corruption in Africa. I say, America must be Africa then. If there's so much corruption in Africa, America must be, uh, be Africa too. There's more corruption in America than ever any other African country has gone to. The only thing is that one, the resources are so few. And the people who are exploiting, there are so many levels of, of uh, exploitation. So the, and the person who being exploited is on the, on the, the common man. So you have all these levels of exploitation, so that when, if you so many people exploiting you, then it becomes really obvious. But in America, it's not as many levels, and they are very subtle. subtle. You know, in America, we are entertained, so you know, basically in the world, people can watch World Cup, and people can come around work together around World Cup. And everybody is looking at, the, all over the world is looking at World Cup. But we will not come together over any other significant much, much more serious issue, like health, right? Glo uh, climate change. We would global warming. We would come together over that, but sports people will come there. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of people have we become? Or what kind of people are we socialized to become? All these things I'm talking about, about they are all segmented, but they come to one thing. So when I talk about, I've just spent two years uh, this year, two months, at the beginning of this year, I was in Kenya, and I did not spend two nights in one place. I was traveling nonstop for two months. I was going to different restaurants, I was going to different farms, I was on TV, I was on radio, I was every, I'm just going to different, understanding the relationship and the gap. Now, I'm only calling it GP, uh, GL, uh, no, no, food gap, FG, the food gap between our people and their food. And it's, an, it's a very interesting concept you're thinking about that way. That now we eat food from Mexico because of the NAFTA. I was in this country when NAFTA passed by one vote when Clinton was in office. And now all this, corn, all this subsidized food, we are dumping it in those country. Now the Mexicans are trying to cross the border because some of them are losing their farms, going bankrupt. They can't grow corn, and corn came from Mexico because we are sending cheap corn there. So it all boils down to a power dynamic. It's a power struggle. The people have been, become so powerless. We've become so powerless. This, this country can say it's going to go to war, and there's nothing we can do to keep it from going to war. So as we talk about veganism, that's a very relevant question. Because if somebody can use up our food, 
something that we use on a very, very basic level. Then what other power do we have? If I colonize your food, so I understood in two months, I've, I'm getting close to finishing. In two months, I was able to understand very clearly two basic points. One, that a people can be enslaved, but those people are not truly enslaved or colonized until you colonize their food. The people essentially become fully colonized when their food is colonized. Because there's so much culture tied to the food. There's so much memory tied to the food. The reason why we eat hot dogs and we want to go to the fair, because there's so much memory about how we grew up. So if I can enslave your food or colonize your food, and now colonize your memory, the only, time you re the only thing you can remember is the artificial memory that I've created for you. Then you will never be free. You, you have nothing to go back to. Yeah. You see, if you've already been used to bad relationships, you don't know no good relationship. So even if you say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to divorce my husband because he's beating on me. I, I, every husband I have ever beat me, so I assume every man beats every woman. So I might as well just be in this bad relationship I'm in. So when somebody colonizes your memory, especially your food, that's the greatest genocide that somebody can commit. You know why? Because you'll never be taken to any court, international court, for any crime. So many people are dying now because of GMO, because of fossil fertilizers, and some of these things, they are not being grown by these countries because these countries cannot grow organic food. No, because the big corporations like Monsanto and the companies Conagra, Syngenta, all these corporations have to create market for them, for, for the country, for the economy to grow. Because essentially, we have a false notion that you can keep going up. We have an economy that's set on getting what, better every year. The economy only go up, right? And that's essentially a false notion. Economy doesn't work that way. We've only been tied our memory of having alternative economic system, alternative political system. Every country in the world is talking about democracy. But if you ask them, people don't have the same notion of democracy. See? So we are being colonized by symbols, right? And being lured to sleep. And somebody is usurping our power. So I noticed that Kenyans were very farthest removed from their food now than any other time, even when we were in colonialism. Because you have all these food that's coming from the outside. Kenya has not been able to feed itself since we became independent. So we always have to import corn. And not because that we cannot grow enough corn. We are leasing, we are leasing now almost 100,000 acres to Dubai for land. Now the Arabs now, the Asians, and the uh, countries in the West are coming back and getting, same time, another recolonization of Africa, getting land so that they can grow food, right, for their populations. Because as we move forward with global warming, a lot of countries, because of the food protest in 2008, a lot of countries have noticed, realized that, as you will be noticed in the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, people who cannot eat enough are very dangerous people. You cannot control people who are hungry. Hunger is one condition that we cannot put off. If I'm hungry, I'm hungry. That's why I say, please pass the food before I talk. <laughs> Hunger is one thing we cannot, okay, I can take a pain kill, a pain kill, if I have you know, bad knee, and I can forget the pain for a minute. I can sleep, I can forget the pain for a minute. But when you're hungry, look, you change anything, right? So, one of the problems that we have in this country is that because we have created Artificially, very cheap food. Artificially, cheap. Because we are financing. I come from North Carolina. North Carolina has the largest pig plant. They produce so many pigs in a day. The pigs they slaughter in a day, Kenya cannot co consume in a month. In North Carolina, in Smithfield. They cannot, we don't consume those numbers of pigs in one month. The gram of pigs produced in one day. In the largest plant in the U.S. in the whole world. Now they take all this pig and they transport them all the way to Iowa, using what subsidized train, right? So we subsidize the plant, 
We subsidize the train, and then when we go to the store, we say, oh, this, I need to buy this pork chop. It's cheap. But, but if you add all the other external, external costs, all the costs that you're subsidizing, then I mean, it doesn't look cheap. But what does that do to us as a community? What does that do to us to our countries? What does that do to our racial relationship? Right? What does that do to our global order? It forces us to be suspicious of one another. Because those people who know understand that we are living well in the US and other developed countries at the expense of so-called poor countries. And when I travel, the most common projects that I hear people engage in, and maybe well many citizens, are converting Africans into Christ. So more churches are being built in Africa than anywhere else and turning their souls to Christ. So I ask these people with all due respect, if you everybody can believe in Christ, what difference would there be? Now we have every year, we have more Christians in my country, every year. But yet, every year, people are becoming more suspicious. We are having more crime. We, have, we have always less food. We have more food insecure, right? Every year, although we want, we believe in Christ. And this has nothing to do with uh, religion. This has, and I, don't, I normally don't apologize. I, and let me say, I always say what I say because if you understand what I say, then you follow what I say. All right? And I, but if you look at the correlation between two countries or two worlds, that one is telling you, we, we need to come and save you. But at the same time, we need to live very well at your expense. But what you need is not more food and to live better, you just need to believe in Jesus. All right, so people become, we ask you to now start eventually living on credit. Because later on, we're going to have a very, very difficult time fixing this system. If you look at the economic crisis in Arapa, during the economic crisis, oh, I, did, I don't know, only one economist, I always hear experts, oh, he's an expert, he's an he's expert of this, you know. The economic crisis hit this country, and Nolia Rubin, who is an uh, economist of Iranian descent, went to the IMF and said, I think there's something wrong. People laughed him off the stage the year before. Then when the economic crisis hit, they could not get him fast enough to come and tell exactly what he saw before, right? Well, look at this economic crisis. They had all these clever ways of producing credit default swaps, right? Mortgage-backed uh, uh, collateral, right? Worth $700 trillion. The whole global GDP is only $70 trillion at least at that time. So if you were to go all over the world and steal everything, you would only pay 10% of the debt of the false papers that this country created. Now as a result of our bear stands and other our, our, our bad companies, now the whole global economy is suffering. So as we talk about food, I think it would be wise to think about how our consumption habits are affecting the whole world. In what kind of world, other than just the climate, or other than just the animal, and I'm nothing again, I'm not apologizing, I'm nothing against the animals. But if we don't, if we want people to be compassionate, the two things we have to do, we have to get to give them more power, more civility over their food, and more political liberation so that they can make a wiser decision and their consciousness can rise and they can have the comfort of choosing, hey, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. But you'll be surprised as I close, I got one or two minutes and I'll take two questions. You'll be surprised how difficult when things get to a certain condition, things being normal, the word normal will become a very radical if it's not already there, to say something is normal or we are normal, that will become a very difficult thing to achieve. Because there have been so many things that are broken, like the economy that I say. You have 700 trillion dollars. How are you going to, where are you going to get that money? 
Okay? So, I hope I've said something that uh, can add to the discussion and that can help us to think about food in a different way. So, every time you eat, you have 32 teeth. Every time you eat, we dig our graves with the 32 teeth that we have. Okay? So, we dig our own graves with our mouth. Okay? And we've given other people. Nobody can ever have power over you unless you see that power to them. Okay? Thank you very much. Two or three quick questions. I got three minutes. Anybody got a question? Yes. Yeah, so what are the top things that we can do? I mean, eating, 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 shopping, and that type of thing. What are the top things that we can do to take our power back? Talk our power back. Thank you very much. Anybody got a question? And I can answer two questions at the same time. Sure. Yes. Uh, millet. Millet. You, you fed us millet. Yes. And as far as I know, that's indigenous to Africa, Kenya. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Is that a political statement? Yes, there's a political statement uh, in, in the millet. Number one, by cooking millet, I cook millet because number one, it's less likely to be GMO. So when you're eating, the, uh, Monsanto doesn't have a big interest in right now because the market is not so big. So the three or four most uh, genetically modified food are corn, wheat, uh, cotton, and uh, soy. Okay, so try as much as you can task from consuming those things. Number two, to answer your question, knowing is the first thing. So I say this in my own analysis. Everything starts with the consciousness and then action. Action is the highest manifestation of belief. Whatever I believe, the highest manifestation of what I believe is what I do. So I can believe it's all right to eat well, but if I don't eat, knowing it doesn't help. So first of all, have that consciousness, then act. If you can just eat well and use least processed food, that's why I cook meal, I cook other, they are least processed. Then you can start the, uh, the companies that are usurping our power. Oh, you, you recognize somebody is taking power from you? If I say, I'm, I'm going to come and shoot at you. Oh, you'll be defensive, right? But you know, if you look at the way we act, we act like we, we always go around the issue. And that's why I say, I don't want to just talk about veganism. I got to talk about the big picture. If we talk about it, you know, a lot of people did a great job talking about it, you know, this more. But we gotta look at the big picture. And to me, I find that most informative and effective in the, the, uh, kind of the, deciding. If, for me, I look at it as a form of war, because that's what they do. They know, they look, they've looked at it as a form of war, and they create a war against us, and to take apart. Nobody takes power from somebody else in a smile. It's a war. Somebody else. Is there a vegan movement in Kenya? Uh, it's a very, very small body movement. So I'm actually, we bought five acres in Kenya when I was there. Uh, we tried to open up an eco institute. First of all, you can't talk about vegan, by the way. Even when I talk, I don't talk to vegan, those people. To talk about that is like going to kindergarten and saying, okay, when you, you need to see your advisor, uh, when you go to college and the best PhD program, kids don't understand that. And I'm not saying that to demean my country. But this is the reality. These people think anything that comes from the West is better. So we gotta have a political consciousness. So people think Monsanto is doing a good job. Now Obama, uh, with the rest of the G8, they talked about, right? Okay, good. Yeah, Obama talked about with the G8. Obama's solution with uh, creating food uh, solution in Africa is to get, bring Monsanto and the other crooks on, the, on board and get them hey, to go and produce more uh, GMO food. Which has been proven it doesn't work. Almost a thousand people are killing themselves every month in India because of growing BT corn. Jeffrey Smith has done a great job of trying to expose you know, some of that uh, in writing about that. So GMO is not going to help. Monocrop is not going to help. And that's what uh, they're doing. Okay, one more question and we are, uh, I'm done. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, most of the grants that are given, if you give, and most people, a lot of people have a lot of money. But when they give the money, they give money. You can, you can actually money, uh, use money politically. So you say you're giving money, but because you're giving money for certain things, then they offset other things. So you can achieve your own political gains just by man manipulating how you give money. The uh, Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation has. Uh, Okay, let me say this while, before I answer that to, to give you a good uh, perspective of where I'm from. In my own analysis, 
I don't think there's too many people in the world. There's too many people, there's very few people in the world who are consuming so much and then they make everybody look bad. So if you go and steal so much money in the bank, they say, hey, I think people in uh, Madison, everybody in Madison has probably stolen a thousand dollars. Because you, you, you stole to your government of like everybody in Madison stealing a thousand dollars from the bank. But I guess everybody else didn't steal, maybe just one person stole. So if you take nine billion people and you take them all in one place, they will only feed LA. The town of LA, you can stand nine billion people in the town of LA. They are standing next to each other. Think about that. Nine billion people only stand. You can put all of them together in LA. Nine billion people standing up. That's not a lot of people. It's because we have a bad culture. So if you have an atomic bomb, and only one person is living on this planet, and they throw that at uh, atomic bomb, they can have more damage than all 20 billion people living here. We need to learn how to live sustainably. And we can live, so many of us can live in this uh, planet, eating good food, eating better food, you know, having better uh, relationship, having better communities. All right, I think I'm done, man. Any, anything else, man, you can ask me, I'm, I'm around. So Melinda, Melinda uh, Foundation, too, I, I remember I didn't answer your question. Melinda, uh, Bill and Melinda Foundation essentially believe there's too many people, so we need to have less children and all that stuff. So the program, and they are geared towards women. All right. So a lot of aid not only just are always geared towards women. So a lot of men, I, I talk to a lot of women in Kenya, say, hey, man, I can't. I'm well educated. I can't find uh, uh, somebody to marry me." So we have to think about it, and we are creating systems that are not organic. So we come and say, "We need to build just like building a church or build or these other things that will make us will create market for the Western countries." All right. Thank you very much for having me. Here. <laughs> I'm on Facebook, Organic and Sounds is my group. Uh, Chef Kubo, you can go with me and uh, keep in touch, like our page, and uh, support uh, what we're doing in the weekend. Thank you.